It is fantastic to see you. Can we just give a, 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 another round of applause to all the volunteers who helped out the light party on Tuesday? We definitely could not have done it without you, so thank you so much. Give me a wave if you're ready for Christmas. Fifty days. Fifty days. If you could give me a little less mic, boys, that'd be really helpful. Fifty days to Christmas. Are you ready for it? My daughter, my eldest, is so ready for this that she's been ready since August. And we have banned the C word in my house. Christmas, the word is banned at the minute. And every time she says it or hums it or a song comes on, I take a pound off her from a money box. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I take five pound out. And... Um, but no, it's 50 days to Christmas. It's bonkers, isn't it? And some of you are really looking forward to Christmas. And uh, the expectations are high. And maybe all the children that have just gone next door, they've wrote their list already. I know Lawrence has written his list already. And, uh, and we're exciting and we're anticipating and we're expecting maybe some, some things. Have you ever played Secret Santa? Have you ever played Secret Santa? If you've never played Secret Santa... You might do it at work, we did it at work, we do it in the family where, you know, you, uh, the, all the names of the family, all the people you work with, they're all put into a hat and you draw out one name, that is the person that you are going to buy a gift for. And it could be a £5 budget, it could be a £10 budget, you could be crazy and go £20, I know Matt Stone goes for 50 but Secret Santa, and, and, and I like Secret Santa because I'm... Because let's be honest, there are some real gems out there for a fiver or a tenner. There really are. If you look, there are some real good stuff out there. And I like Secret Santa because I'm expecting something good from someone who's bought me a gift. But then Secret Santa can go horribly wrong as well, can't it? And I remember being at my previous workplace a couple of Christmases ago and uh, I got given my Secret Santa gift. And it was clearly a book. It was, it was clearly a book. And I thought, oh, they've bought me a book. It's going to be on someone, someone's autobiography that I don't really care about. Or it's some recipe book because I might have said at one lunchtime that I'd love to be able to cook better. And I'm just grabbing this book and I'm thinking, oh, you know, my, my expectation was up here for Secret Santa, but now suddenly it's down here. And then it went even lower when I opened the present. Because when I opened it, and I kid you not, the book was entitled, are you ready for this? 50 sheds, sheds, garden sheds, S-H-E-D-S, 50 sheds of grey. 50 sheds of grey. And as I opened it up, every page was a picture of a shed in a slightly different tone or shade of grey. It is the worst present I have ever had. And when this goes on YouTube later and that person watches, they'll, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So thank you very much. Fifty sheds of grey. Uh, my anticipation, my expectation levels for Secret Santa was up there, and what I got went right down here. Hey, listen, in July, I left my teaching career, 22 years as a teacher, following the call of God in full-time ministry here, but, but we, we, we organised was a big leaving do. You know, after a long time at work, you're, you're thinking, I'm expecting, and everyone came out. It's like, for, the, for a big department that I worked in, everyone was there on that night. And it was, I was expecting a really good night out. It's going to be great. And, um, and you know, at work, you've got friends at work, haven't you? And then there's just people that you work with. You know what I'm on about, don't you? But you've got friends at work, and then there's just people that you work with. And am I leaving to, after 22 years, around about half past 10, 11 o'clock at night, my friends started to bail on me one, one by one. Oh, so I was trying to remember the kids, we've got to go, they've got to be up early in the morning and we're going away for the weekend and we've got to go. So are you okay if we leave? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. So my friends one by one left me with people who I just work with. And it's my leaving do. And so, I kid you not, I got home at close to 3 a.m. that morning because it's my leaving do. So I felt I couldn't leave on my leaving do. So I had to stay with people who I just work with caring for them, nursing them, helping them into taxis, apologising to the taxi driver for what they might hear on the way home, and, and all that because it's my leaving do. But my expectations were up there, and what I got was 
There's something a little different maybe. Have you ever booked a holiday? And your expectations, oh, because you've seen the brochure. You've looked at the pictures online. You've read the reviews from Trustpilot. And, and it's, it's good in it. It's looking good. And you've arrived to see that there's renovations happening in the hotel. They're building a hotel next door. And you've accidentally ended up on an 18 to 30s resort with your family. Have you, have, has that ever happened? I know to one couple in this room it has. They shall remain nameless. You're okay, Pastor Kirk. And also, maybe, <laughs> and maybe you've applied for a job. You've applied for a job, haven't you? You know, you've, you've, you've read the advert. And you're thinking, this looks good. You know, the salary is quite enticing. It's not bad. The perks, if you get some perks, you know, a little bit of health care or maybe a free pass to the gym, that's good. But then you've started work and you realize, what on earth have I let myself in for? Has that ever happened to you? We, we have these expectations, don't we? And, and that's what an expectation is. An expectation is a strong hope. It's a, it's a belief that something is going to happen or you're going to get something that you want. That's an expectation. And, um, and there's a strong probability that this thing or this event's going to happen. And then if you've been like me, whether it's in Secret Santa or you're a leaving do or a holiday or a job, sometimes in life, those expectations are unmet, aren't they? And um, unmet just means that our needs or our desires aren't satisfied. And an unmet expectation, I just think, leads really quickly to you feeling frustrated and disappointed because you had something in mind, but what is in reality something very different? And that's just about an event or a, or a thing that you're going to. What about a person? What about expectations in, in a person? I mean, maybe some of you who own your own businesses or maybe you're high up in your company and you're the one who's doing the hiring. And the CVs come flooding into the office and you're reading through them and you're thinking, wow, this person sounds fantastic. But when they turn up for interview, oh my word, that is a completely different story. We, we've had, I've had many people apply for jobs at my previous school and I've read the CVs, but when they've turned up for interview, I'm thinking, seriously, you are not going to last a second in a school. And, and maybe as well that maybe you've tried online dating. Give me a hand if you tried that. No, don't put your hands up. <laughs> don't put your hands up. Some of you were far too keen then to admit that. No, I'm joking. So, but maybe, <laughs> that made me laugh. But on, online dating, maybe make the profile picture. Maybe you've looked at the profile picture and thought, yes, nice, nice. Oh, they look nice, or they're handsome, or they're pretty. And, and you've read the, the bio that they've left, you know, the, how they've described themselves. And you're thinking, this person sounds all right. And maybe you've exchanged, got the numbers or the email, and the messaging's gone really well. And, and then you get to that time where you're going to meet up. And oh, my word, when you meet them, is this the same person? Is this, this profile picture, this doesn't look nothing like you. And you see, I think we can have unmet expectations in a person as well and so often we we expect so much of a person and then when that expectation isn't met we often feel really let down don't we and you know what Jesus never quite met the expectations of the people either you know um, they'd read his profile you know, they'd, they'd read his bio because, because the, the, the young Jewish boys and girls, they'd, they'd been brought up to know and learn and, and, and remember what the Messiah would be. Who, who this person would be, how they would act, what they would not necessarily look like, but what they would stand for. So they knew what they were looking for. And so the, the Jewish expectations of the Messiah really did focus on a conquering king. And, and let's be honest, initially, some of those expectations, when Jesus kind of rocked up in Nazareth, some of the expectations were met. Like, like he was a miracle worker. Like, he, he did seem to, to almost possess authority over demons and disease and even death. And, and, and he taught 
extraordinary things and he had great insight and showed amazing wisdom and, and, he, and he focused really on, on this nation of Israel being, and, and, on, and offered, almost offered them a better future. And, and the general populace of the, of the people back then heralded Jesus as the Messiah because on Palm Sunday they kind of paraded the streets and as Jesus came in on a donkey they were kind of singing songs and laying their clothes down and waving palm trees and, and they were like, yeah, this is the, uh, the Messiah. But we all know that was really short-lived. You know, a, a small band genuinely recognized Jesus as the Messiah. They, they, their expectations were met. Gosh, it's really late to have an party next door, aren't they? But even for them, their expectations were short-lived because Jesus was soon to be crucified and killed. And, and, and throughout his ministry, you know, there's lots of people trying to question and find fault in Jesus because they just didn't accept his credentials. And so there's a mismatch between what they expected and hoped and what they were and what Jesus was portraying. You know, for example, you know, when the custom was that every year on Passover, a prisoner could be released. Uh, and we know the story of the Easter story is that in, they had a choice of Jesus or Barabbas. Barabbas, this murdering, violent person, what did they choose? They chose to release Barabbas because, because their expectations of a leader would be one who would defy the Roman rule and authority. And Jesus' non-resistance to the Roman rule meant, you don't fit my expectations as an all-conquering king and messiah. So we'll, we'll release Barabbas, thanks. And so the crowds force almost Jesus' crucifixion because their expectations weren't met. Are your expectations being met this morning? Are your expectations being met in life? Maybe, you know, maybe you're a guest here this morning. Maybe you've been to church many times, many decades perhaps, and uh, you, you know, you're, you're meeting this biblical community and maybe you've got friends who are Christians, but do any of those leave you with unmet expectations? Maybe you're thinking, I, th I thought Christians were supposed to be different. I thought church was going to do X, Y, and Z, but I, I, wasn't and I wasn't expecting that. And maybe you have unmet expectations of Jesus too, just like the crowds did back 2,000 plus years ago. Maybe you have got unmet expectations of Jesus too. Maybe you thought Jesus was going to heal me or my family members. I thought Jesus was going to put a stop to my anxiety. I thought Jesus was going to ease my financial pressures. I thought Jesus was going to find me a stable job, maybe find me a partner. I thought this, these are my expectations, but maybe I'm, but maybe I'm not experiencing that. Do you have unmet expectations, church, of Jesus? You see, in life, I think, in just life, and in faith, I think we, we just live with many unmet expectations, don't we? And, and maybe it feels that our demands and our wants and our desires are not being met. Maybe life seems to be a bit of a mismatch. My, my great expectations, my high expectations of life and God and this are up here, but what I'm experiencing and what I'm living out are down here. And maybe you can relate to that. There's a, there's a mismatch in what I'm expecting, but what I'm experiencing. But let me put a spin on this like a good politician. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian here this morning, doesn't Jesus have expectations of you? What does Jesus expect of me as a follower of him? Yeah, I've got expectations of Jesus, but, but what does Jesus expect of me? What are the great expectations of the church? Not just here in Small Heath, Birmingham, but the church globally. What's the, what's the expectation of it? What does the world expect of me as one of Jesus' followers? And is the world and Jesus having their expectations met by me and you. So our theme over 
the next few weeks here at Trinity Birmingham is one of great expectations. And uh, next week is Remembrance Sunday, and that will be just kind of a, a standalone service. But, but for the rest of November, we're going to be digging into what are the great expectations of you and me, and how do we live those out if there are any? What is Jesus expecting me to be and to do? And, and then how do I live those out? Because there's two different questions, aren't they? Knowing what they are and living them out are two very different things. And we want to help all of us learn to grapple with the great expectations that Jesus might have of us versus, well, I'm not quite living that out yet. And how do we, how do we go about that? So is that okay? That's what we're going to do. So to answer that question initially, we've got to go back to the bio or the profile of Jesus. Because we need to know what the people back then were expecting. So, this in a summary behind me are just the, a real summarized, condensed version of the expectations, the biography, the bio, the profile of the Messiah, whoever that was going to be. We know it's Jesus. But he was, he was this, the Messiah would be a Hebrew man. We've got all the scripture references behind me as well. He'd be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. He'd be a prophet akin or similar to Moses. He'd be a priest, coming from the order of Melchizedek. He would be a king, coming from the line of David, but he would also suffer whilst on earth. That's just a summary, a condensed version of that. The QR code on the right-hand side of the screen, if you want to scan it, will give you a little bit more in-depth details into the bio of the Messiah. So you can check that out. You can take a scan of that now at any point if you want. We'll leave that up for a few more seconds. But that's the bio of the Messiah. And let me just say this, that Jesus met all of those messianic requirements. He met them all. He fulfilled them all. The expectation he fulfilled. But the three main offices, or the three main roles, if you like, that the Messiah was going to fulfill is what we're going to look at specifically over today and the following two weeks at the end of the month. Prophet, priest, and king. So just tell the person next to you, just go, are you ready? to learn more about the prophet, priest, and king. Go on, ask him. Now, if you want to take some notes, feel free to. Then you can go home and study them. You can use that QR code as well to help you. But the three main roles that the Messiah, that Jesus would fulfill, would be prophet, priest, and king. Now, let me just help you understand. The prophet, the role of a prophet is to represent God's power and purpose. The role of a king was to represent God's presence and powerful rule on earth. And the role of the priest was to represent God to the people and the people to God. So these are the three main roles, if you like, of Jesus' uh, purpose for coming to earth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into Jesus the priest this morning. But I don't want to just leave it as learning about Jesus the priest. I want you to understand by 12, 15, 12, 20 p.m. that you are also called to be a royal priest, representing Jesus on earth. So are you ready for it? Good. So what's a priest? Now, some of you may have been brought up in a, in a Catholic tradition, or maybe you went to a Church of England uh, church, or maybe you have no idea of what church is, and so all you've got to base your thinking on is movies and TV shows. All right? So I want to give you the definition of a biblical priest. Not something that we see on, in Hollywood, or maybe we, we, you know, we've grown up, but, but a biblical priest according to the Bible. So a priest is someone who presides over this overlapping boundary of heaven and earth. So just imagine that. We've got heaven, we've got earth. And a priest, according to biblical uh, terms, is someone who presides over this overlapping boundary. In other words, their primary function is to represent God to the people, but also represent the people to God. So that's what I mean by an overlapping boundary. In other words, the priest, in biblical terms, acts as a mediator between the divine and human, between heaven and earth. I feel like I'm doing staying alive dance then. In other words, the priest, he or she, would embody and represent the divine. 
So from represents God to the people and the people to God. And the story of the Bible, if you've ever read the Bible, you try to read through the Bible, the story of the Bible is one unified story that simply points to Jesus. That is the story of the Bible. And right at the beginning, Adam and Eve, and their Hebrew names simply mean, Adam means human, Eve means life. So that's what their names mean. So Adam and Eve are called to be and represent God's image in this holy space or this sacred space called earth. So, so that's what they were asked and tasked to do. And it's only after Adam and Eve and humanity rebel and try and go their own way and do their own way and, and not really kind of follow God's way is that they gave up that role that God had asked them to do. God gives them the role, represent me well. Because your role as a priest is to represent God to the people as well as people to God. And so the rest of the Bible is simply God's mission to undo that tragedy so that we, humanity, can regain access to God's presence and become his royal representatives once more. Is that, do you follow me? So, back to Jesus' time. All right? So in the time of Jesus, the people of Israel were ruled by the Roman Empire, but governed by the, the, the local Jewish priests. Okay, so ruled by Rome, but governed by the Jewish priests. And there was a, a hierarchical system in these priestly duties, and the person at the top was simply called the high priest. And in the time of Jesus, his name was, for two points, Anyone know? Apart from the front row, you are, not a part, you are not allowed to take part, front row. His name was Caiaphas. Okay? So he's Caiaphas. He's the high priest in charge at the time of, of Jesus. And the high priest is the only one out of all the priests who could enter what they called the Holy of Holies, the most sacred space where God by his spirit would dwell. He used to dwell in a tabernacle back in Moses' day, and now he lives in the temple that they built. And it's only Caiaphas, the high priest, who's allowed in once a year to meet God almost face to face. And so when Jesus comes on the scene and we pick up the story, not as a baby, but as an adult about to begin his ministry, we've got Caiaphas in the temple, the Holy of Holies, and we've got Jesus just outside of Jerusalem being baptized in the River Jordan. And some of you may know what we hear and what is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in Jesus' baptism. What's recorded is this voice saying, you are my son, whom I love, with you I'm very pleased. Now, what's the significance of me telling you that or reminding you of that? Is that all good Jewish boys and girls knew that this saying was really part of their Hebrew scriptures. And these, this saying would be pointing to the person who they would know as the Messiah. So for example, the king that we talked about earlier, in Psalm 2 verse 7, okay, it says this, he said to me, you are my son, today I've become your father. So when they hear, you are my son, this is, this is part of the promise. This is a king has been promised to Israel. The ears begin to pick up. The next part of that sentence is, whom I love. Well, this talks about the beloved son. Genesis 22, verse 2, that story of Abraham and Isaac. And Abraham says, or God says, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Again, ears begin to prick up. And the third part of this statement, in who who I am very pleased, again, from their scriptures, they would have known this really well. Isaiah 42, verse 1, talks about the suffering servant who would die for the sins of the people. And again it says in Isaiah 42, it says, here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. On hearing these three connecting verses, when, when they hear this voice going, you are my son, whom I love, in who I am very pleased, suddenly, well this is talking about the Messiah. So Jesus' baptism is almost his ordination as a priest. That's what's happening here. And it's no surprise afterward that Jesus then goes on to behave like a priest. And what does he do? He forgives people of their sins. 
He, he restores people who were impure so they could re-enter and access the temple again. But these things are done by the priests in the temple, not by Jesus. And so Jesus is beginning to work outside of the priestly authority, if you like. And so they start to see him as a threat. So when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, basically what he's doing, he's challenging, subconsciously challenging the authority of the current priesthood who are running things in the temple. And that's why he storms into the temple, he throws the tables up, and he basically says, guys, you are treating my father's house like a den of thieves. And he gets really righteously angry with it because he is acting as the high priest. But you would say, just a couple of weeks later, that he doesn't look very ruling because Jesus is taken to be flogged and then he's taken to be crucified. But you've got to remember, or we've got to learn, that the, the pattern from the scriptures that they were learning is that a priest would get forgiveness for people by offering a sacrifice. And so Jesus, on his death and ultimately resurrection, he's become the highest priest. And in doing so, he's restored God's blessing by offering himself as a sacrifice, enabling us and the rest of humanity be, to be restored to our original calling. What's our original calling? To represent God to the people and the people to God as holy priests. If there's anything I want you to take away today, is this. You're calling as a, the royal priesthood of God. Let's represent God to the people well, and let's represent the people to God. See, the difference now is that God doesn't reside in that tabernacle, that sacred space, or the temple anymore. But now, when the Holy Spirit came upon the, the early church, God now resides in each and every single one of them and can reside in each and every single one of you. And we become almost mini temples. Have you ever considered yourself as a mini temple? Walking around, I'm a mini temple. But you are. Because God by his spirit will come and dwell and live in you, will empower you, strengthen you, guide you, help you. Because that's what, who God is. Because he wants you and I to represent him well to the people but also to represent the people to God. You see, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, here's Peter. He's, he's talking about the, to the early church. He's trying to help them understand this. And Pastor Kurt's already nicked my verse this morning. It's terrible. But he says this. It's on the screen. It says, he tells the church, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, here it is, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. There's the great expectation, church. There it is. You and I are holy priests. In case you missed it, Peter re-emphasizes it again a few sentences later. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. He says this again. He says, you are not like that talking about their old way of doing things and old way of thinking. He says, you're not like that. You are a chosen people. Just tell the person next to you, give them a nudge, wake them up and go, you're a chosen person. He says, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And here's the result of it. Here's, here's the expectation coming back to you. So the expectation is you're a holy priest. All right? So what do I do with that expectation? That's the big question, isn't it? So, okay. Okay, God, yeah, I'm a holy priest of yours. So what do I do? This is what he says. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. It's, it's really, it's not, you don't need a degree to read the Bible, do you? You don't need to be a doctor of theology. Here it is. You can show others the goodness of God. See, Peter's telling the biblical community back then, isn't he? He's basically saying, represent God to the people and the people to God. But you know, here's my big question. Those people in, in those days, in those ancient Bible days, half of them weren't priests. They were just 
They were fishermen. They were merchants. They were soldiers. They were slaves. Hello, Mayfell. They were tax collectors. They were the poor. They worked in the world. They didn't work in the temple. Yet they understood their calling and they began to act and talk as if they were holy priests. Basically an extension of Jesus on earth. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 says this, All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. And as I come to a close, I want to to encourage you this. They, the early church, they began to live in the light of this new understanding that they were called to be the royal priesthood. They were called to live in light of Jesus and be his royal priests. And so I want to end with this. What did the priests do? like literally do, on a day-to-day basis then. So if we could summarize that, what would they do? Well, here's three things. Number one, they would worship. They They would worship God. They would gather the praise of creation. They would encourage one another to to worship God and they would encourage one another to sing songs and hymns and and stuff. And they they would gather the people and they would say, hey guys, let's gather together and let's just worship God. You're called to do that. You're called to do that at home. Gather, gather the family, gather the kids and go, hey guys, we're just going to say grace <laughs> over our food. That's a time of worship. We might stick on a song in the background. Listen, why well, don't you just have a listen to that? You might just be encouraged into a time of worship. The royal priesthood, you and me as priests, were just called to worship God. So gather the people in your home, gather the people at work, gather the the people that you hang out with and maybe find an opportunity just to pray together, just to worship God for a moment. Secondly, what did they do? They represented. They represented. Represent God to the people and the people to God. As his royal priests, I want to encourage you, represent God well. Think about how you react to people. When someone winds you up at work, how are you going to react to it? Maybe keep your hands in your pockets when they're not looking. Maybe hold the tongue. Maybe respond in a different way. Maybe react not the way that you want to, but represent God well. Represent him at at home well. Because in church, it's really easy to represent God well. Oh, God, I'm representing you today. It's so easy. I'm not saying any of it's fake, but it's really easy to represent God for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. But at home, it could be a whole different matter. Work, it could be a whole different matter. And as God's royal priesthood, represent him well. The third and the final thing of the role of a priest was simply to intercede. Intercede on other people's behalf. The priest was called and his job was to to take up other people's causes and go to God with them that's what that's what their role was worship represent intercede and I want to encourage you church a little bit later on in our service if you could put the other screen on for me Jacob that would really helpful but in a minute I'm going to ask you to think of someone in your home or your family or your workplace who you can intercede on behalf of Because you'll know someone who needs a touch from God. We all know someone. It could be yourself. You can intercede on your behalf, you know. You can pray for yourself. You can lay hands on yourself. (laughs) But there might be other people that you can intercede for. They might not even know God. They might not even want to know God. It doesn't stop you from praying for them. It doesn't stop you from interceding for them. Because that's your role. As As a Christ follower, I'm called to worship, to represent and to intercede. And when we imitate Jesus, the royal priest, the great high priest, we live in a way that reunites heaven and earth. Because we're the mediators between the divine and the human. And that's the great expectation. Not only of Jesus, but also us as his followers. What was an expectation? 
there was a strong hope or belief that something will happen or it's something that I want to happen. It's an attitude of hope and anticipation and it's a strong probability that this will happen. Hey, if you just want to maybe close your eyes this morning, maybe or even just look at the floor, just give people some privacy. I just want to encourage you that the great expectation that we have in Jesus is that he is our high priest and he will mediate on our behalf between us and God the Father. Jesus is praying for you right now. He's representing you to God. And what Jesus did as the high priest, he didn't just offer an animal sacrifice like all the other priests did, but he offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And he became that bridge that would reconnect God with humanity. And the great expectation is that we can live in is that Christ is enough. Christ is enough to deal with our mistakes, our issues, maybe it's some of the things that we may have got caught up in. Christ is enough, church. Hebrews 6, verse 19 to 20. Just listen to this as I'll just read it. It says this. It says, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. What hope are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is our hope. It carries on to say, it says, he leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has gone in there for us and he's become our eternal high priest. Now we're going to say a prayer together in a minute. And it's a, a prayer that you can have great expectation and hope and anticipation in Jesus. Knowing that he won't leave you, he won't leave you wanting, he won't leave your needs unmet. But all we need to do is simply accept that Jesus can do that on our behalf, believe in his work on the cross, and then confess with our mouth that Jesus is now Lord of our life. Hey, I'm going to say a prayer. It's on the screen behind me. We're all going to pray it, but if you want to pray it for the first time, you mean it sincerely, you want to recommit your life to God, then I, as we're praying all aloud, I just want you to put your hand in the air. But as a church, we're going to pray this out loud. Maybe we'll lower the lights a little bit, give people some privacy. But let's pray this together. And if you mean it for the first time, I want you to pop your hand in the air whilst we pray. You can say it after me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. And if you mean this for the first time, just raise your hand in the air while we pray. I am sorry for sinning against you. I now turn away from my sins. Please forgive me of those sins and be my Lord and Savior of my life. And you know what? If you prayed that prayer, whether you raise your hand or not, then after service, in the foyer, please come and speak to one of the celebration hosts or myself or, or Pastor Kirk or Trace or anyone that you've seen on stage today. And we'd love to help you on that journey. But now over to the rest of us, or all of us, as his royal priests. I want to just give us an opportunity just to worship him. Because that's what a priest does. They worship Jesus. And then I'm going to come back after just singing this bridge for a little bit. And then we're going to challenge us all to go and represent Jesus. So would you stand with us? Let's just sing the, the bridge of this chorus, uh, the bridge of this song or the chorus, whatever it is. Let's just have a few minutes just to worship God, knowing that Christ is enough for you. Christ is enough. Christ is enough for me. Christ Come on, let's Christ raise our hands as we worship God. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. That's right, it's your role as a priest. Everything it's to worship I God. I have decided. Yeah.
don't be a spectator this morning. Let's worship God just for a few more moments. Make it a prayer this morning. was to worship God. I know I'd encourage you maybe this morning it was, you know, you felt it was too quick or whatever, but that's your role. Worship God. Not just in church on a Sunday morning, maybe in the car on the way to work, on the bus, on your AirPods, while you're walking the dog. You can worship God anywhere you want. You can worship Him while you're washing up. It's quite hard, but you can do it. But I encourage you, that's, that's a role that you have as the royal priesthood, the royal representatives of God is to worship him. So never put down the opportunity to have a few moments or a few minutes or even an hour with Jesus. You know, then, that's how I want us to lead today. Because we've got to represent God well. That was the second role of a priest. Represent God well. And wherever you are the rest of the week, wherever you find yourself, and when someone says something that you're not liking, or something happens that you weren't expecting, I want you to remember, God, I'm here to represent you well. And if that means I need to bite my tongue in that moment, then bite your tongue. If that means I need to ask for forgiveness because this is how I'm feeling against that person, then do that. But let's represent God well to the big wide world out there. Because there's a lot of misrepresentation of Jesus. But let's, let's be the body of Christ that we're supposed to be and let's represent well. Doesn't mean shouting about it all the time. Doesn't mean getting your Bible and bashing it over someone's head. Doesn't mean that. Just means in your day-to-day -day life, in the way that you hold yourself, the way that you talk, the way you interact with people, the, what, the wisdom that comes out of your mouth because you spent time with God, that's representing Him well. And you can do that and I can do that. And lastly, this is it, the last role of a priest was to intercede on someone else's behalf. And this is what I want us to do. As the band just play, I want you to think of someone right now. I want everyone to close their eyes and just think of someone that comes to your mind. Someone you know who's facing a challenge or a problem whether it's financial, whether it's employment, whether it's family, whatever it is, you know the person that's come right to your mind right now. And your role as a royal priest of Jesus is to intercede on their behalf. So I want you to take them to God now in prayer, and I want you to spend 60 to 90 seconds just interceding for them. Don't think about the dinner, think about them. And let's just intercede on their behalf for a few more seconds. And let's all do that, band included, me included. We're going to just intercede on people's behalf. Come on, we've got 60 seconds to 90 seconds. Let's go. You can pray out loud. You can pray in your head. Do what you need to do, but intercede on, on their behalf.
Dear Jesus, thank you, God, that we are your royal priests. And God, it might be a role that we don't want. <laughs> Maybe we're kind of holding off. But God, as a follower of you, I pray that we will know our role, that we live in our role, that we walk in it well. So God, this week, we just pray. God, that we find times to worship you as our king, as our priest, as our prophet. God, the expectations that we have of you are huge. And God, through worship, we just pray that we would, we would know that you are with us, you're for us, you'll never abandon us. You've got great plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us. And that God, we can cast our cares on you because you care for us. So God, I pray we'll worship you well. God, I pray that we'll represent you well. I pray our lives would shine brighter than our mouths. And that our interactions with people and at home would just represent you well. And this week, God, I just pray that we'd be stirred to intercede. We'd stand in the gap for people. God, we, 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 we go before you on their behalf. And I just pray you'd stir us to pray for certain people, whether it's people, groups, or individuals. God, just, just remind us our role this week and, and help us to realize that prayer makes a difference. So God, you are holy. God, you are holy forever. And that will never change. And so we're so thankful, God, for your time in this service. God, we just pray another blessing over rain as we've dedicated him this morning. God, we thank you for the visitors and the family and the guests and the people that call this place home. Bless us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone said amen, amen. Amen. Well, there you go, amen. I don't need to say amen again, do I? Listen, we're going to end the service there. Have a wonderful week. But go into the foyer, grab yourself a drink and a pastry. Interact, say hi. Ask if someone needs prayer. Maybe